for us, for the student community, uh, not just the student community, I think for the uh, larger framework, I, I, it means a lot to us to um, have you speak to us because I think it's a particular kind of uh, what we what we are aiming for. Okay, we are live now on YouTube. Uh, what we are aiming for ultimately is um, towards a more democratized, um, a more inclusive um, science, right? Because I think um, for tech in Nigeria, um, in Africa, I think tech is something that has really um, it has been fantastic, the rate at which people have been going into tech. And I think it's because it's open to everyone, but there's this gatekeeping of sorts that happens with the sciences, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have platforms like um, Coursera, edX, um, things like that are available to people in tech, but not in the sciences. So I think um, the, the ultimate aim of this is to um, try to build something in that direction, right? Something for a more... Um, inclusive and democratized science that it should be available to everybody, not just the most gifted ones, right? Everyone should come and, I don't know, just have fun, just listen to people and, I don't know, be inspired by all of this. So thank you very much um, for accepting to um, speak to us. So quickly before we start, I think I'm going to, uh, but of course uh, you, uh, Dr. Thomas will be, uh, is, I think he's going to say a bit about himself. Yeah, so have a have a short bio. Don't read the whole thing. I'm I'm telling everybody that everything at the beginning, and then we're gonna talk some science after that. Oh, okay, fantastic. Okay, I think I will just uh add it over now. So thank you okay. very much. No, that'll work. Cool. Thank you so much. I mean, I think this is amazing that you all organize this. Um, just a funny, funny story. I've tried to get to Africa so many times, brothers and sisters. Um, and every time just something happens where I just don't make it. Um, so hopefully, as I said in my tweet, um, when I'm able to come and visit you, I mean, give me a list of the universities. I'll get my own bread and I'll come over there. And then I, I'm glad to hear that you're working with Ghana, too, so that I can really make the comparison between Jolof Rice in Ghana and <laughs> Jolof Rice in Nigeria. So I really do appreciate that. And I'm very, very happy to be here. So I'm going to show a few slides. Um, it's one of these keynotes that I that I usually work with um, that talks a little bit about my journey. Um, it's very kind of similar, you know, not not that dissimilar, I don't think, um, to what you guys have going on over there. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what I'm working on in the next talk. Right. But I do want to leave ample time to talk with you all. All right. Because um, there's plenty of opportunities that you may know about in Africa or that I may know about that's happening actually in Africa. And there's tons of opportunities in the U.S. Um, and I'll give examples of some students that I work with from Nigeria, right? Um, and then there's also many, many, many programs and universities that are looking at West Africa, Africa period as a source of great talent, um, myself included. You'll see what my group is about. Um, we have people from all over the world, all right? So I'll get it started. Feel free to, to interrupt or talk with me. Um, and then we can go from there. Let me share the screen.
Um, Raphael, could you please confirm it's still um, a co host? And my weapon is not here. He's joining us, Maps Nigeria. Who is in charge okay. of this? Um, it's coast now. Could you make me coast? I don't know. I think we're in there. Can you all hear me? Yes. All right. Awesome. Let's go. Sorry about the, the technical difficulties. All right. So I tell people all the time, I'm not hard to find. I'm on Twitter. Um, or X or whatever they want to call that. Um, you can send me an email address, uh, email at any point. Um, if I don't respond in like a week, just ping me again. All right. Um, I'm here for the people. I am of the people. And then also, I just want to say a little bit of a disclaimer. This is everything that I'm talking about in this talk is mine alone. Right. I'm in a very special privileged place in academia. I'm a free black man and I'm tenured and I'm in America. I have a lot of resources and I pray that I don't embarrass my mama or my wife or my family or the ancestors that I think a lot about. And then also my students. Right. So this was a text message when I was given a keynote um, <laughs> and you'll see Gucci Man is one of my favorite rappers. He's from where I'm from. Um, and then this is a text message from my mom. So she was like, oh, no, don't embarrass me. And we'll talk a lot about my mom and my dad um, in this journey. So kind of what do we want to talk about is uh, how a small optics lab, right? So my, my background in optical spectroscopy that you'll see a little bit, and you'll kind of see how I developed that background. Um, but we'll talk about how a small optics lab changed my entire world. Um, then I'll talk about how I hope that my lab can change the world. You guys are now a part of that. Right. I've been trying to get to Africa for the longest. Um, and in that context, um, we're going to to really have to to see how I want to have a global impact. All right. And then last but not least, I'm going to talk about how each of you in the audience, professors, students, faculty, I'm sorry, uh, administrators, how you can create your own lab like this and you can hopefully change the lives by others. Um, and then again, like after this, we'll have a little Q&A and then I'll talk about more scientific things that we have going on in the lab and, and do it like that. All right. So this is the outline. But why are we why are we starting with superheroes? Do you guys get comics and everything over there? Yes, no, maybe so. Does anybody recognize any of these people? Our characters, rather. Okay, okay, somebody say they know. All right, now, I have a question for you. What do they all have in common? Ah, they saved the world. Well, not in all of them, there's a, there's a villain right there, Magneto. Uh, it's some type of superpower. Okay, now look. Do we recognize these individuals? Okay, somebody said that they're scientists. Oh, somebody said that that's what they have in common. Professor Abada, yeah, okay. Yeah, he's exactly right. Because all of these characters that you see, fictional characters are quote unquote superhero scientists, right? These people right here, these people right here, they're all superhero scientists to me, okay? These people right here, we can go one by one by one. I hope you meet them in person, okay? The guy to the top left, first black man ever to get a PhD in the entire world. It was actually the sixth PhD in the world in physics from Yale University. We've always been in this game, guys. Don't let them tell you otherwise, all right? The, the person to the left is actually the first black president. He's a Haitian immigrant. 
of Rice University where I went to school. Rice University just now, Rice University just now started a program with Nigeria. I'm going to send it to you. I want you to send it to everybody. As you know, in Houston, there's a large Nigerian community. One of my favorite people in the world is Dean Lewis. She was, a, she was my dean at Howard University when I was there. Then we got on the right, Bill Wilson. He's at Harvard. For the, for the faculty members that want to connect and use free things, a lot of the research that I had was done at Bill's lab. Then at the top, got my guy, Jean Leotine. The diaspora is a very important thing to me, right? Jean's from Martinique. I didn't realize why my advisor really wanted me to meet Jean. When Jean came to Houston, I was blown by his stories about how he built the lab in Toulouse, one of the first magnet labs in Toulouse. And here I was as a young graduate student, which you'll see a little bit later, working on these same things. Now, these folks right here, they're all my personal friends. They're all in my phones. They're my mentors and the people I look up to. And I'm lucky, except for, you know, Professor Boucher. But that said, they don't get necessarily all the recognition all the time that these other folks have, right? These are also very important physicists to me, right? But they have a little bit higher profile and you'll see a little bit later. But my point being here is that these superheroes, these black physicists and engineers, these famous physicists and engineers that some might be black are all superheroes that helped change my world in some way. But let's talk in particular about one particular superhero. Do you all remember the, the movie? Oh yeah, somebody said they're Africans, let's go. Hold on. Okay, let me talk about one story. And that's the story of Wakanda. Not the movie, there was a comic first, right? And it was actually developed by a guy named Stan Lee. So Stan Lee, he named it the Black Panther after the Black Panther movement out of Oakland. This was one where Black people were struggling for rights. I'm from the South in the U.S. I remember walking around seeing colored only signs that you can drink here and there. And we'll talk a little bit about experiences, how segregation and those types of things shaped me. Wakanda forever for sure. So in this comic book, it was first came around in 1967, and then it had its own series. And those that are my age, around 40, there was even a cartoon about it. But does anybody know that Black Panther was also a physicist, his alter ego? Matter of fact, he got his PhD from Oxford. He also was respected by his peers, okay? In particular, other the fellow other physicists, ones like David Banner, or AKA the Hulk, referred to T'Challa as one of the greatest minds that he ever came across. Now, this is also important. He was also a skilled hunter and a tracker. And then due to vibranium, then they were able to use that natural resource. Man, I'm in Africa talking about natural resources and how people can use it. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, a sidebar, but took their own natural resource of his people. And then he went and go study to make that resource better to then function for the society of his people. Now, he had a full, full life in America, or sorry, in, in, um, in Oxford. When he left Africa to go to Oxford, then he assimilated into this environment. He turned into a student athlete. He was swimming around. He was learning all these other things. And then he brought that also back to his community. This is important. Now, let me talk about a little bit about my origin story. I was born in a place called Albany, Georgia. If you look up Albany, Georgia, what you'll see is that W.B. Du Bois, who also had to leave to go back to Africa, that's a longer story, W.B. Du Bois described where I came up as the poorest and blackest place in America. And it's still like that. The COVID-19 vaccine, I'm sorry, the COVID-19 pandemic hit and it hit Albany and it hit Albany the worst. 
we were like the one red dot that happened. This is my dad right here. He's holding me. I had to be probably less than one in Tallahassee, Florida. A lot of my people, a lot of my dad's people passed away just because of lack of resources in Albany, Georgia, where I came from. I did a first, I did a book, book report in grade one. It's like sixth grade, I'm sorry, six years old. And in that book report, I worked on black astronauts. And then from that time, being six years old, I'm now 40, I've been working towards being an astronaut. And one of those astronauts was actually by a name, a guy by the name of Ronald E. McNair. Ronald E. McNair, we'll talk a little bit about him later, but he was a laser physicist, right? So I'm looking at this book at six years old and I want to be an astronaut. And I see this guy by the name of Ronnie McNair in there. And it said, well, he was a laser physicist at MIT. So I said, okay, that's what I'm going to be, a laser physicist at MIT, okay? So I, from that, I had that goal. I was ready to go. But the other thing that's very, very important is I had people that were advocating for me because they knew how important education was, right? And I, and not only did, in the U.S., we have a term, it's called tiger mom. And it's particular to people from East Asia that immigrate to the U.S. And then their children excel in the U.S. system as immigrants because their mother puts so much pressure on them. We call that a tiger mom. Well, I had what was called a panther mom, right? My panther mom lobbied for me with the school board such that I was the only person in my entire school district that was allowed to take a high level of physics, a physics that was college preparatory, a physics that prepared for me to be right here talking to y'all over Zoom in Africa. And I never really understood why my mom fought like that until after my dad passed away and one of his best friends was talking about how they desegregated the school in my hometown of Albany, Georgia. My friends went to this middle school. My mom desegregated that school. She knew how much education really means and what it means to be othered and what it means to be left out. So that right there really was a big turning point in really what I was going to do. During high school, I was able to do a health careers opportunities program. I didn't want to be no doctor, like medical doctor, not in that way, but I was able to go to Morehouse and we'll talk a little bit more about Morehouse, but I was able to go to Morehouse at 15, 16 years old, make lifelong friends, and then also start to get college credits as a high school student. I would go back to Albany, short drive down, and then I would be so prepared because I went to that university, Morehouse, and really got to learn not only about myself, but science, and then really how to grow up to be a man. That said, I wanted to go to Morehouse, and I went early. I went early like Martin Luther King. Um, and and I for went my senior year in high school and I was early admitted into Morehouse College. And that was really where it was at. That's me and my mom in Chicago, actually. Um, she's one of my favorite people. She keeps me motivated. Now, at Morehouse, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but Morehouse College is in Atlanta, Georgia. We're most known for our famous alumni like Martin Luther King Jr., right? Samuel L. Jackson, Spike Lee. Even today, um, some of my classmates are quote unquote famous for good reasons and bad reasons. We won't necessarily talk about that. But uh, the dude, Sean King, he used to live in the dorm next to me, right? Like, dude, this is what we do in America. And it's really all over the world. Like if his young African brothers thinking about college, come to Morehouse. We'd love to have you there. There's some that are there now. Um, but that said, Morehouse has a rich tradition, not only in making leaders around the world, but also making physicists around the world. And I was very, 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 very lucky to choose Morehouse to then study physics because it, it didn't seem weird to me. It was just like, this is what people do. They come from wherever their community is. They come to this spot right here at Morehouse and you could just be a physicist like any other black man. Little did I know what was in store for me after I left Morehouse. Uh, that said, in the Atlanta University Center, physics majors take classes together. So it's not just Morehouse all male 
institutions. I'm oh, sorry, all males in the same class. We took classes with Clark Atlanta University. I took classes at Clark Atlanta University. I also took classes at Spelman College, which is an all women's institution right across the street. So it's kind of like a collective of small schools that work together to build these physics majors that then go out in the world and hopefully change the world. Now, the guy that I'm taking a picture with, this is real, real crazy, y'all. So this is this guy is by the name of Walter Massey right here, Walter E. Massey. He was the first physics major at Morehouse College. If y'all Google Walter Massey, man, he's the GOAT. Like, not only here in this picture, I was a senior in college. He was the president of the university. He had just been the chancellor of the entire California system. So that's Berkeley, that's Santa Barbara, that's UCLA. He was on top of all of that. He then, after left, leaving Morehouse, he was went to Bank of America. He was on the board of Bank of America for a very long time. Oh, yeah. Okay. Y'all know him. Yo, you know what's crazy? In Chicago yesterday was the Chicago Quantum Summit. We recreated this same picture. This was in 2005. Yesterday, we took a picture just like that. It was so dope. Now, that said, sidebar, back to Morehouse. The other thing that Morehouse did for me is that it also trained me in optics and photonics. And we'll talk a little bit about how that happened. But in the same way that I'm going to preach to you all about how we have a quantum initiative of all over the world for quantum computing, building the quantum internet. During my time, early 2000s, everything was nano. In the U.S., we had what was called the National Nanotechnology Infrastructure Network. I would go to Georgia Tech, which was right down the street, and then I would learn skills like my microfabrication because I, at Morehouse, we didn't necessarily have anything but the small optics lab. But the ability to be able to go and be trained and this large facility was there for me and we took full advantage of it, right? The other thing that was important at Morehouse is that I forged lifelong friendships that were from everywhere, right? Um, and that allowed for me when I was at Howard and even now and even yesterday, um, last week, the National Society of Black Physicists met in, in Oak Ridge National Lab. A, a lot of my friends from that time at Morehouse are now professional physicists that can help my students get internships and opportunities. And guess what? You guys send me an email and I'll make sure that they come and do a talk like this and or also visit you and also open those opportunities up to Africa. All right. So those guys are still around. Now, let's talk a little bit about the goat himself. Right. So this guy right here. Is the, the chair, he's currently the chair of the physics department at Morgan State University. All right. But after his postdoc, he got his PhD from Georgia Tech. And then another black physicist by the name of Robert Dixon recruited him specifically to come to Morehouse. There he built this small, very small optics lab, like 10 by 10. A lot of donated equipment from his old advisor. And he built this lab. And when I tell you we all came from this lab, we all came from this lab. I was able to build more skills like microfabrication, like optics and materials characterization, like uh, engineering design. And this was all funded by the National Science Foundation in this huge, huge consortium. So then Morehouse students were then able to then go to these other places and see other things than that they were used to, right? This was the model that I was taught when I was 16, I'm sorry, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. When I was in that environment, I was learning directly from him in his small lab how the game goes, how you can do more with little, with little resources, how you can collaborate with folks to educate your community. I learned all of that at a, a critical time in Dr. Rockwood's lab. Now, let's look a little bit about Dr. Rock's legacy because it's just not me. Out of that little tiny lab at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Dr. Rockwood has produced 35 PhDs. I am one of them, right? In total, he's also produced other graduate degrees, something like master's degrees 
and medical doctor degrees. And this Jewish doctor is like being lawyers. Now, this is the really, really cool part about all of this. My first PhD student that graduated out of my group was a graduate of Morehouse College in 2015. I graduated 10 years early. While he was at Morehouse, he was working with Dr. Rockwood. He then came to Howard University and he was my first PhD student. It's even going on now, even though he's not at, at, uh, at um, Morehouse anymore, he's now at Morgan State. He still sends me his best student, which is now my student, Atia Davis. And now she goes every single day. She's probably in lab right now at RB Research Lab in Adelphi, Maryland, taking data. This is the system. He taught me the roadmap of how to do this type of mentorship. And we continue to work together in this way. Now, why is this important? And why did I say that I was so lucky to go to Morehouse College, right? And I'm talking a little, I'm talking a lot about a US perspective of what's going on, y'all. But it's just little similarities, and we can talk about that in the Q&A, right? But in the U.S., we had a real, real problem for a while that's still going on, where you don't necessarily have a lot of Black physicists, right? Even though the first Black man got his Ph.D. from Yale University in the 1870s, right? And from 1999 to 2020, Morehouse College was the top. I'm a part of this number. My friends are a part of this number. Over this 20-year period or so, there was only 200 or about physics majors that we produced at Morehouse. We were obviously the lead at this. But then, man, look, if you start going down and down and down and down and down, all these dots right here are historically Black colleges and universities. These are our schools. They were made for us by us, right? There are two schools that... I'm sorry. Oh, that's not even on here. I'm sorry. I read this wrong. So this is um, the two schools that created more than 100 are us and Morehouse. I'm sorry, Xavier and Morehouse. Dillard has a great history of producing young black women in physics, including Dean Lewis. That was my dean, but also a graduate student that I'll show you guys a little bit later. Ashley Blackwell came from Dillard. Um, but that said, you have all of these spaces where over 20 years, right? Some of these people aren't even producing any physics majors at all. And I'll talk more about the team up report and what we're going to do about it. But the point here is that I was at the right place at the right time. I was at Morehouse when we were at the top. I was in a spot that was created by Dr. Rockward, right? Dr. Rockward created this. I was at Morehouse. I was able to be at the top in this environment. I was very, very lucky. Some of these other folks weren't as lucky. And that's part of the things I want to change. Now, Last week was the National Society of Black Physics meeting. And the National Society of Black Physics meeting, every single time that we get together, I get a new opportunity, right? So back in 2001, when I was a student, I, a group of my friends met a guy by the name of Al Ashley. Al Ashley was at Stanford Linear Accelerator um, Center Slack. And all he did was work with students in the way that I tried to work with students. He didn't have a booth. He didn't have a career fair. He didn't do any of that. He just walked around. He saw three young brothers in the suit and he gave us a scholarship. And that scholarship also had an impact on my life. Um, not only was it some bread that I can like <laughs> live as a poor college student, um, but really and truthfully, what it really did was it allowed for me to meet this guy right here to the bottom. I talked to him last night, actually. This is Vernon Morris. Vernon Morris was about the stage of where I am now. So meaning he had just gotten tenured. He was around 30 or 40. He's actually, actually I can, I know exactly how old he was because he's 20 years older than me. Uh, so yeah, he's around 40 something at the time. And I remember being a young college student out of this Morehouse environment. Now we're in DC and here goes this guy. He's built this center. He has all these accolades. And then when I talk to him, he's just like a regular dude from Atlanta that had a profound impact on me. Little did I know later in life from that time period of being a college student that then at Howard University, he would be my main mentor and he's still my mentor today. I met him in 2001. We talked yesterday. Now, after Morehouse, I was 
able to travel to a far, far away land. If you all have been to the U.S., you'll know what I'm talking about. Texas is a very strange place. It's very, very different than anywhere I've been, even in um, even in Albany. But I went to, to Rice University, and then I was there to pursue my Ph.D. in applied physics. It really, really opened up a lot to me, y'all. I was able to perform experiments in Japan, all over the U.S., in various government labs, Essentially, anywhere that had a, a very high magnetic field, um, the highest field I've used is around 100 Tesla. Um, the magnet that you see me here is only 10 Tesla. I say only. Um, but this here, my me and my advisor over here standing on an optical table. Don't do that. We'll talk a little bit about him later. But um, yeah, anywhere I had a, a Nike shoe box and I would just set my experiment up at the facility and then able to do experiments. Um, this is important because, again, this is a user facility. I was at Rice University. It had tons of resources, right? However, this is, again, another important data point that helped me later in life because I went from not having a lot of resources, that small optics lab at Morehouse College, to now I'm with the big boys at Rice University, but they're still using these user facilities. We'll talk a little bit later about what happens in my career where I go back to not having a lot. But, of course, I say all this to say that at some point, you all have to do something scientific, right? There are scientists, you got to do something scientific. In order to graduate with a PhD, you have to make a contribution to the field. My contribution to the field was that I was the first one to experimentally demonstrate paramagnetism in metallic carbon nanotubes. After I was able to do that, they finally let me graduate. <laughs> this was me. Like, notoriously me. This was me in graduate school with my homie Darius and, you know, had the flip flops on. It was Houston. Houston makes you drive everywhere you go in Houston, right? It's hot and there's air conditioning everywhere. So you dress kind of funny. <laughs> but this is my first setup, man. I was so happy to be there. That was my small op optics lab at the time. But, you know, we also had fun at Rice University. They have something that's called beer bike. It's really like a Harry Potter competition. Um, so this is me on a slip and slide. Very, very, very fun. And, you know, this is my boy Darius right here. He went to Morehouse with me. Best man in my wedding. We were what was called spiked out sitting in the front row, as we like to do, watching basketball, U of H. Notice all the undergrads are standing up, but we're seriously, seriously, seriously watching the game. We were able to, to take advantage of that. Um, if you guys are familiar with basketball, um, while we were in college, uh, we saw Derrick Rose while he was at Memphis. Um, we saw Brooke Lopez. Um, these guys are kind of old. They're not in the league anymore. Um, and then we saw, uh, uh, what's your boy's name? I can't remember the guy from our, I'll think about it later. But at, at any rate, like for free, we were able to see all these NBA players after we were in lab all day. So that was dope. Now, another very, very important thing that happened was that I was on a fellowship from ONR. So this is the Office of Naval Research. Um, they have what's called the Historically Black Colleges Universities Future Faculty Engineering Program, right? Man, at the time, to be honest with you, I had no idea that I would be standing in front of you as an engineering faculty member in 2009, right? It was a lot of money. It was a dope fellowship. I was like, all right, cool. I'll just kind of learn how to be a faculty member, whatever. Um, and here I am, right? The other cool thing is that I was able to be at one of the facilities. So I was in Houston, Texas, and then I was able to go to D.C., Washington, D.C., fell in love with D.C., um, I, but I was able to go to Washington, D.C. and work at the Naval Research Lab with Dr. Lee Johnson. Dr. Lee Johnson went to one of these other HBCUs, Lincoln University. They were on the list out of Philadelphia. Um, and then at Lincoln University, very, very interesting story about Lincoln University is that um, when Einstein was at the, the height of his career, like at the top of the top, most he had he was in New York Times about um, no cloning theory, entanglement, all that EPR paradox. They were putting him in the New York Times. Einstein, everybody wanted him to come around, right? And you know what he did? 
He didn't go to those talks. He didn't go to these fancy places. He was at Princeton, but he didn't go to Harvard and give a talk. He didn't go to to um, any of these other universities to give a talk. He went to Lincoln University, the HBCU, to give a talk because he knew what that would do for that. You know what I'm saying? He knew who he could meet, what kind of an impact that would be. Because of maybe even because of that visit, then you were able to have produced somebody like Dr. Lee Johnson that I could work with that summer. Yeah, think about things like that. Now, I also did something very different. I was working on magneto optics and carbon nanotubes. And then that summer, I was a- actually able to look at what was called an electronic nose, where you would use gold nanoparticles for biosensing applications. Man, it was such a good summer. Then I was able to go back to, to Rice University, right? And at Rice University, again, I was in another program that was training me how to be a faculty member and I didn't want to be a faculty member. <laughs> and that said though, there's also great, 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 great mentorship that I had at Rice University outside again of my PhD advisor. Um, these three folks to the right, um, Richard Tapia, he's a university professor in applied mathematics. He had that program, AGAP. He was working with Teresa, who's one of the best people in the world. Um, she was like everybody's auntie at Rice University, you know what I mean? And uh, they worked together to really to, to really set me off on this track of being a faculty member. I was also in what was called um, this International Graduate Education and Research Training Group, interdisciplinary, that's what the I is for, in IGERT. So the ID in IGERT was exactly what I was doing. I was learning about really... Um, solid state physics, but light matter interaction in a very solid state physics way, um, looking at semiconductors and metals. But the entire point of IGERT was to train you in something else. Um, so later in the, the graduate career, I was able to take a lot of classes in nanophotonics from Naomi Hollis. Naomi Hollis is going to cure cancer. She's dope. She's doing everything. Um, But that said, that was kind of my Rice University experience. Again, here, I'm being trained as a faculty member. I don't want to be a faculty member. (laughs) Again, I'm being trained as a faculty member. I don't want to be a faculty member. (laughs) And then also, the other thing that was very, very important, I went from being that little kid that my dad was holding in um, my grandmother's yard in Tallahassee to now being this international scientist who I am today. I've been to Japan several times because my advisor was Japanese, right? He wanted me to to know where he was from and his culture, but he also wanted me to make these connections all over the world. And I'm thankful for June for that. Um, One of the funny, funny things here is that these guys right here, um, at the time, Eric Einrensen, he looks like a big Nordic guy, (laughs) but he's actually from the U.S. and he got his Ph.D., um at Tokyo Todai he ended up going for Todai to the University of Buffalo we write proposals together now um this other guy right here um Kadoff he's actually in Singapore I was in Singapore a couple weeks ago I hit him up he actually was in Bali with his family I didn't get a chance to see him but it's these interactions that you can have in science and then you can really build upon those relationships and then help your students. And now I'm making a point to send students international as much as possible. I would love to write proposals with Africa. Please give me the opportunity to have Black African-American students come home and for African students to come and interact with us. Please afford me that opportunity. I can't wait to work with y'all in that way. So I finally graduated, right? This is me on the day that I defended my PhD. And there's some real scientists in this picture. So that's me with the tie on. That's my my bro, my Morales brother right there, Darius, right? You saw us spiked out. We were together today. He graduated a little bit later. Um, ah, hey, man. I'm sure y'all already got a Nigerian Rockwood. But if, it, if it's not one already over there, trust me, I got y'all. Um, Cuz. On that PhD, Rock flew to come see me get his PhD, um, to get this PhD. And then there I am with my two advisors. And, and little did I know that that was very, very special time for us. Now, 
something that that taught me was how important it is to, to, to continue your mentorship, right? Rock was mentoring all those other people, but he needed to see me get my PhD. So he flew and, and did that, right? And now what I do is when my students like that go get PhDs, I do the same thing. I was at Harvard for the first black PhD. Uh, sorry, the third black PhD, which was a woman, which is Linnell Williams. That room was full of us supporting our community, right? That's what we do. Now, my first job, guess where my first job was? I graduated from, from Morehouse. I'm sorry, I graduated from Rice University. And I went right back to Rock's lab, right? I went right back to Rock's lab. And it was great. When I tell you it was the most amazing thing that could ever happen, and I'll tell you why. All those experiences that I talked about, going to Japan, doing experiments at all these magnet labs, meeting all these people, learning all these things about how, how to be a faculty member. I took all of that knowledge and I went back home, right? I went back home and now I'm able to, to give that to other young people. My boy, Philip Nwachiko, right? He's a, a, a fur, he was a Nigerian uh, American from Houston, man. We were on, I hope this picture is in here. Yeah, we had Philip on a zero gravity flight. That's me floating in the air. These are the opportunities that we can have when we, when we introduce students and we really, really have this thing going on. And that experiment was actually pretty dope. Um, it was actually with CubeSats. Um, so we were looking at kind of a, a delay for putting out solar cells and power on CubeSats. So how would that work in zero gravity? Um, my guy right here, Kofi Christie. Kofi Christie was an undergrad at the time. I was mentoring him at Morehouse College. Now he's at Louisiana State University as the first black professor in environmental engineering. If you're interested in environmental engineering, I can plug you with Kofi. He'd be more than happy to work with you. But this is very, very important. I went back home, but home didn't have a space for me, meaning that there were no tenure track positions at Morehouse. And you know, I was a young married dude. I needed a paycheck, so I couldn't be playing around with Morehouse like that. Oh, but what I was able to do then was that I had to leave home just down the street a little bit. I continued to work with More Lab, and I also continued to work with Morehouse students. But then I was able to then go and build my own lab again. And at this time, not only was I building the lab, but I was building a program in, pre, uh, in pre-engineering. And I was also the director of the Nesby chapter. And I taught a lot, right? I was teaching maybe six, seven classes a semester, which is like nothing close to anything that I was teaching. Um, and, and to be honest with you, that was probably one of the best times that I was at, I had in physics. Um, in the U.S., we have these things called community colleges, right? It's colleges for the community. They don't necessarily, it's not necessarily always about preparation, um, meaning that you're not prepared for college. Sometimes it's financial. Sometimes you're working with kids or you're working at night. And you're just trying to get an associate's or a BS degree to improve your family. Um, non-traditional students is what we call them, ones that have a break between high school and college, no matter how hard that break is. Some people are working, they come back. Those are very, very serious students, right? Because now they know what they're paying for and what that could do for them. It was amazing to be able to teach at Atlanta Metropolitan State College. And I even got some grant money too. Now, on this, I was at Atlanta Metro. This is 2013, right? Out of nowhere, I had the opportunity to go to Howard University. I had a phone call. They were like, hey, Thomas, we need your help. I said, man, what are you talking about? He's like, I need your help. I said, all right, cool. We can do some science together. He's like, no, 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 you need to come here, right? So I went to the Howard University, right? This is in um, Washington, D.C. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. But at the Howard University in 2015, I joined them as, as that tenure track faculty member. 
And then I be, uh, began to build another lab, right? And in building this other lab in applied physics and materials physics, I also joined this large group. If you remember, Rock was in this very large group um, at a Northeastern, and that's how I learned terahertz spectroscopy as an undergrad, right? Following that same format. These two tables were, do were donated by Donnell Walton. Donnell Walton used to be at Howard, U Howard University in the 90s. He donated me those two tables that I, so I could start my laboratory. He's now um, the CEO or whatever. He runs the lab at Corning West. So he has a research lab, Corning Glass. He runs the entire thing. This dude, Donnell, he donated me, he donated me these tables. He supported me when I needed it, right? Now, from 2016, right? From 2015 to 2016, now I have students in lab, right? Here, no students, no equipment. I ain't have nothing. I get a little support from the Air Force. I get a little support from DOD. Now I can start to buy lasers. I can hire students in a postdoc and we published our first paper. This is very important. I got investment from my community, right? I was able to get a little table that I was writing my way out of this, man. Writing is so important to science. Communication is so important to science. I got my point across all those ideas I've been developing for so many years where I didn't have any resources. I put them all on paper and I started to get my resources. Fiona's now at Harvard, right? Um, my Ethiopian brother, Sarat, he's about to finish his PhD. Oh, she's getting her PhD at Harvard, by the way, um, in applied physics. And then now... Um, this guy, Sirak, right here, he's getting his PhD from, he's from Ethiopia, but he's getting his PhD at Johns Hopkins. And this is my boy, Wale. Wale is from Nigeria. He got his PhD at Howard University, and he's now an engineer at Intel, right? Him and his wife got their PhDs from Nigeria to, um, to Howard University, and now they're working as engineers. This this is what it's all about, right? The small optics lab did its job. That's it, 2018. This paper right here, I think is on 200 citations. I wouldn't say it's my best work, but it's one of the most respected ones. Um, so that's in 2018, I continued to work and grow. And then, man, the science starts to get crazy. I go from Optics Express to PRB, to now I'm publishing op uh, Optica, Nature Communications, that type of thing, right? I went from nothing in 2015 all the way to a career award in 2017, 2020. This crystal right here was grown by Fiona at MIT, right? My current student went to MIT to do experiments a couple of weeks ago. This is kind of how this all works. I'm, I, I learned the game from Dr. Rockwood and now I'm implementing the game, right? In a very, very large way. Now, if we can take a sidebar, of course, at the end of the day, I'm just a scientist, but I'm a Black American scientist, right? And we talked a little bit about this story, but I encourage the professors, the students, and everybody in the room, and I'll send this guys, I'll send this to you guys, but I encourage you all to read the American Institute of Physics Team Up Time Is Now reports. Came out in 2020, and it changed a lot of things, and I'm glad that it came out, right? Because the idea of it was that you can make systemic changes to increase African-Americans with bachelor's degrees in physics and astronomy. That was the entire report, right? At this time, I'm a faculty member. However, my students, I, 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 I knew that there was something that I, that I needed to do for my students to increase the numbers. What do I mean by that? So to the right, you have all the bachelor's degrees earned in physics from 1955 to 2018, all of them, no demographics, whatever. This is everybody, right? Um, and what you'll see is right around here, there's this exponential increase. Right now, we're probably the most physicists that there have ever been, people with BSs in physics degrees. Of course, in the US, that doesn't always translate to the blacker or the browner you are, right? And in particular, what you'll see is that this is all the other students and these are the black American students. 
the darker line, you probably it's very hard to see because it's very, very small. Right. And if you look a little bit closer, they zoomed in for you. It's only around 200, 300 every year. It's thousands of everybody else. It's two or 300 of us. Now, the other thing that was very, very concerning, mind you, I graduated in 2005. That's my data point. These are my students' data points, right? Nothing's changing. Everybody else is increasing. Nothing's changing. Actually, we're decreasing, right? So this was the problem. And American Institute of Physics, they brought all these people together. And then they were able to provide not only the context of the solution, but a plan to actually change this. And that, that plan is in the works. Um, that I'm a part of the plan. So not only am I doing this science thing, right? But I'm also having to have a role. Um, they like to call it DEI. I'm not a DEI expert. I just happen to do this work because I have to do this work for my people, if that makes sense. Um, and then now that work continues because engineering is not any better. Um, in fact, in some ways, engineering is worse. So here what you have is a gender parity, or sorry, gender disparity. Um, so it's always something like 25%, 75%. So only around 20%, 25% of um, engineers produce are women, no matter what it is. Um, and the crazy, crazy part is, of course, if you look at Black or African American, then you have the same distribution. It doesn't actually matter, right? The guys are always going to do better right there, unfortunately, um, until I have a say about it. Uh, but that said, the lowest demographic here is Black or African American women in engineering. Look at that. I mean, they they had a genocide on these people over here, and then we're still very, very small. Now, this is a real important issue. There's an opportunity there, too, um, meaning that in the U.S., Black women go to college more than any other demographic group. However, in engineering, they're the lowest. That's something that I'm currently working on. Um, now, let's talk a little bit more about the team up charge. So they were able to examine and assess the reasons why there's this underrepresentation that is presented, I'm sorry, and is persistent um, for African-Americans in physics in the U.S., only other the bachelor's level. So they got all the member societies together. Um, they wanted to give recommendations for departments and they wanted recommendations for stakeholders. And they produced this report. And we'll talk a little bit about the report. And in the report, they attributed the five factors. You'll see this again. But these are the reasons why um, Black students weren't successful at the time over that large period are not as successful. Um, and, and it's very, very important to me, right? So this idea of belonging is essential for persistence, staying in physics. It's essential for success, being quote unquote successful in physics. This idea of belonging is different than this idea of physics identity, how you see yourself as a physicist, right? Are you a physicist? Man, when I read that report, I was almost in tears because I was hearing these young people talk about how they, how these people made them feel like they were less than or they were some type of imposters. It's called imposter syndrome. Like they didn't belong to be in physics or they didn't, they weren't physicists themselves. Man, you know who the real imposters are? The real imposters are people that think that they can mentor you to the capability of becoming a physicist. They don't have that ability. And then that's the insecurity that causes them to make them make you feel that way. So don't ever have imposter syndrome. If you under the sound of my voice right now, man, you could be a physicist. I promise you that. And if you reach out to me in my community, we'll make sure that that happens. Um, that said, the other important parts are academic support. This is effective teaching and mentoring and student-centered support. And then also in the U.S., man, it's a crazy financial situation, um, especially if you're a young Black person trying to get a college degree. Um, kids need money is what I say. So I do everything that I can to provide money for students such that they can feed their families or at least survive in college. And then last but not least, and this is the one that most people struggle with, is the fact that it's not really the students, it's the institutions, it's the structures, it's the, the policies. The policies are crazy. Like, yo, why are you, why is this the case? And then you ask a question and they're like, oh, I don't know. Somebody did it in like 1960. And I'm like, bro, 1960? 
Like it's 2023. Why don't we take a look at the policy? So these are the five factors of what's done of why um, of why you have the the systematic. This is what needs to change, right? We need to instill this into the community, and then we are actually able to do this in two different ways. Um, so on YouTube for the professors and others that are interested, I'll also send you these workshops. Um, so we have workshops on YouTube that were co-started by myself and then Dr. Darren Norman. She's a dope astrophysicist. Um, so you all should invite her next year. Um, but that said, um, we talk about seminars about each one of these things and how you can take the knowledge of the of the team up report and then apply it to your situation. What I like to say to people all the time is that if you focus on the people that aren't doing the best, then the people at the top will also benefit. So it's not even like, okay, this is just Black American, and I just mean American, Black American BS physics students. Like if you apply all of this in the, the, to the universities and systems in, in Africa, I'm sure you will, will have a great time. And then you can actually apply this at any institution. Right. Students need to see themselves as physicists. Students need to be able to belong and be successful. You need to effectively support them academically and financially. Right. It doesn't matter what they look like. All of these things need to happen for us to be successful in the world as academics. So these are the workshops that I was involved with. Uh, again, I'll send those to you more than happy to. Um, but then the biggest thing that I was able to do at Howard University is this. So. What I'm doing is I'm building a quantum future, but more importantly, what we want to do is we want to build an open, like exactly what Dosu said, open, diverse, and inclusive quantum future. That's the only way that this is going to happen. Everybody has to be there. It just can't be at the elite universities. It can't just be through people's networks. Everyone has to be involved. And that's what I want to do is to build this community. And IBM gave me an opportunity to do that. In the U.S., Right. Like now it's being even recompeted. It's being recompeted meaning the sense that this is a renewal of the National Quantum Initiative. And I'll talk about kind of in the next talk about how quantum engineering spaces in the world. But there's this large investment in the U.S. to bridge the gap in preparation and participation in the U.S. for quantum science and technology. And then there's all these geopolitical political reasons of why they really want to do this. But what really struck me by this was the fact that the room looked like this. And no offense to these people, because I know them and they did a great job and all of that, but there wasn't nobody in there that looked like me. I had an issue with that. And it was a bigger issue in the sense that if you look at this, right, it's a global effort. Man, y'all see this? Where's the quantum money in Africa? Let's make that, let's change that, Nigeria. Can we work on that together? No, it's not, it's not sad. It's an opportunity. We take all these, we take all these things as opportunities, right? Because again, if you look at who's investing in it, US is doing their thing, right? But the biggest thing is these boys over here. That's what they're mad about. That's the geopolitical thing. China investing crazy amounts of money in that. Singapore, I was in Singapore, man. Singapore is a very small place. Singapore got a lot going on, right? But that's all good. Like I said, I'm more than happy to work with Africa on this. Let's do it. We need to do it. Now, again, I said I was at Howard University, right? At Howard University, these folks, man, they, 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 this is what Howard University is all about. It's about providing an educational experience of exceptional quality to students and particularly for Black students, right? That's the mission of Howard University. It was starting what was called the Freedmen's Bureau. So after slavery happened in 1867, you had about 18 or so Black institutions that were formed. Howard University has been, has a federal appropriation from the Department of Education every single year. The entire United States of America supports Howard University so that it can educate Black students in theory. Um, and as a result, um, that has produced alumni in civil rights and entertainment and in science engineering. Our current vice president is a graduate of Howard University, um, the T'Challa. 
Chadwick Bozeman, rest in peace. He's a graduate of Howard University. Like that's this type of spot is no nothing to play with, but there's also a lot of great science that goes on there. And in particular, in particular, we have a guy by the name of Herman Branson. Man, he was dope. And what's crazy about him is that he got his PhD. I hope I have this in the slide. If I'm not, I can just talk about it. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah. So this gives you a little bit of timeline. Love it. So in 1863, we had Emancipation Proclamation. Juneteenth, and this is uh, what Abraham Lincoln wrote to quote unquote free the slaves. Um, and then in 1865, so it took kind of two years for it to travel all the way to Texas, just because information moved at a slower rate then. Um, so in two years, this is really when they now Juneteenth is a popular thing in the U.S., but at any rate, um, but on June in 1865, all of the, the black people were freed, quote unquote. And then um, from 1865 to 1876, then we were able to produce this first PhD award to any black person in any field in America, the sixth PhD in America, period, in physics. No demographic, number six was my guy, Edward Boucher, right? Then you had, in the 1920s, you had the first quantum revolution. And they also had, in our community, you had what was called the Harlem Renaissance. Right. And the Harlem Renaissance, you had a, an awakening of like black culture, jazz music, writers, like prolific writers like Langston Hughes. Um, but you also had scientists involved in this effort. I don't really talk about that. Um, and then also, again, my guy, Herman Branson, he was the fifth black person to be awarded a Ph.D. He got awarded his Ph.D. He worked with a guy named Podolsky. Anybody familiar with the EPR? Paradox, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, Podolsky, bro. Yeah, he was working with him. And then uh, the crazy part about it is he left Cincinnati, like I left Rice University, and he went to Howard University. He was at Howard for a very, very long time, working with black students and fighting for black students. This is an American Journal of Physics. I encourage you all to read this paper. Right. And in it, August 1942, in the American Journal of Physics, it's called Physics Training for the Negro Student. Right. And in this, he makes this argument that in this, he makes this argument that black students need to be involved in essentially the Oppenheimer Manhattan Project. And we were. But um, he makes this argument. And he really makes this because a lot of times when you make these kind of diversity arguments, they want to say, oh, you know, black people just want reparations. They want this, that, and the third, blah, blah, blah. No, bro. What he was really saying was this is not the fact of us trying to get like more money or federal funds, whatever, whatever. What we're doing is we're an American institution fulfilling its responsibility to American black people, right? If they, you have this thing going on, we need to be involved because it's taking our taxpayer money to do. That. Little did I know that in 1942, right, everything that he's talking about in this paper was things that I was dealing with the National Quantum Initiative. National Quantum Initiative had $1.2 billion. You know how much of that money came to the black community at the time? I'll tell you, 900,000. There were only two PIs at Howard University me and Tina Brower, no one else was involved. No other institutions were involved in the National Quantum In Initiative, HBCU institutions, but Howard University. And that's mostly because we were in DC. So I took this knowledge and I went to IBM. I said, hey, look, IBM, we have this thing that's going on, com quantum computing, quantum information science, and black people getting left out. And they said, what do you mean by that? I said, look, it's so $1.2 billion. I got the majority of the money for the black people. And it's not $1.2 billion, right? Um, how, what can we do to get more people involved, right? And they said, write me a short proposal. Let's, you know, come up with a plan. And I came up with the plan. And that plan was the IBM HBCU Quantum Center. Mind you, I'm at Howard University. 
and I'm around all these great students. I'm doing well scientifically, right? People respecting me as a scientist, but I'm, I am need to know that it can't just be me, right? Until I came to Zoom, I don't know how many of you all even know I knew I existed. Right. There's only a, there's only a little bit of impact that one person can have. Now, imagine if you had like somebody said earlier in the chat, imagine if there was the rock of Nigeria. Right. Imagine if there was a rock of Ghana. Imagine if there was a rock word in um, Ethiopia. Right. South Africa, all these places like we need this everywhere. So what I was able to do is I was able to create this network of 24 now HBCUs with the goal of increasing the number of Black students educated in quantum information, science, and engineering to strengthen the efforts of the faculty. It's not always just about the students. It's about the resources and the, and the infrastructure and the faculty members there. And I hope faculty members are listening to what I'm saying. That I'm willing and, and happy and, and more than happy to help with infrastructure and building your program and working with you in the research facilities, right? On research collaborations. I'm not only over here just trying to, to get you great students, that game happened. No, I want to make your institutions better. That's the type of thing that we're doing. And that, again, like I said, we are, are, not only are we providing scholarships, internships, fellowships, all of that things for our community, but we're empowering HBCUs to be a leader in the field. We were able to do that. That's cool. The other thing that's important, too, is like the U.S. is an interesting place in the sense that typically a lot of the investment happens in large cities in the East Coast and the West Coast and a little bit in Chicago. That's it. The South is forgotten for many, many reasons. Now, historically, all the HBCUs or the majority of the HBCUs are in the South. So just take away the fact that we Black people in the South you're leaving out parts of the country, the entire parts of the country, just because of just things are on the coast. Now, by us investing in HBCUs, we automatically invested in the South. Everybody, everybody in the South was impacted by the fact that IBM decided to listen to us and decided to invest in HBCUs. And we're kind of regionally se separated. Again, we have 24 institutions. Each of these institutions are there for a scientific reason. Um, and in particular, Spelman College, um, like I said earlier, Spelman College is an all women's institution. Now, why is that important? If you remember my conversation last time about how black women go to college the most, but then they're not as successful in science and engineering. If we put the investment into Spelman, now we've automatically started to address that particular issue and that's happening right now and actually on youtube for those that are interested um we're going to have a women in quantum symposium series just like this where i'll be more than happy to invite you all to it so that you can see um women in quantum that are doing their thing and highlight it and that'll be at spell now there's a little bit of what we're doing so we have all of these things important, including access to IBM quantum systems. Um, we also, again, support the faculty. So, and then we also engage in the community. I know that IBM does a lot with Africa. So let's, let's, let's pull it in, let's make it happen. Anything that I know that's happening in Africa, I'm more than sure to send it to you, especially these ideas of summer schools or winter schools that they're having. I want you all to be included. The other thing, right? We got a high powered group of people that support us. If you're and uh Bubakar Kante, he's from Mali. That's my guy. Um, but uh what we have here, I moved to the advisory board, but we got the people behind us, the people that are supporting us. Charles Brown, man, y'all need to have him talk. He's at uh he's uh, at Yale. He went right back to Yale, man. He got his PhD from Yale. Yeah, he's dope. The other guy that you need to invite is my guy, JD Whitfield, bro. He's out, he's out at uh Dartmouth. Me and JD were classmates together in Morehouse. That's how that works, right? Um, again, Donnell is there, right? Donnell donated my first table. Then we got Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson let me go to Harvard for free to do uh experiments while I was at Howard University. 
We got Reggie DeRoche, the first black president at my alma mater, Rice University. This is one of my grad school friends. If you know Nadia Mason, she's dope. She's now the dean at, um, at U Chicago. Her first student was actually Serena. Serena's at University of Washington. Y'all reach out to Serena. We out here. We're here to help. But this group of people are the ones that really drive the, the um, IBM HBC Quantum Center, and they help me a lot in doing this effort. Just in the first year, we're having this impact, and I'm so happy this picture is here. So what you see before, when they had quantum things in the U.S., HBCUs were involved. When they had the uh, the APS March meeting in 2022, it was in Chicago. And we were able, these are all talks, including this paper that just, um, that's my paper right here. We just got the cover of ABS Quantum Science, where we took the West African game in Kala, are sometimes called a wire a, 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 a o. I don't know if you guys know this. It's like um, seeds in a pit going around, and the real ones know how to do it. We developed that into a quantum game, meaning now the entire pit is quantized, right? And then, um, and it violates the rules of Macaulay. And Now you can develop a quantum engineering state engineering strategy based off of the West African game. That's the type of stuff we be working on. Let's do it together. Oh, very, 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 very important. Now, mind you, it's 2022. This is in my lab in Chicago. I told a story about Jean Leotine that was at Toulouse, in the Magnet Lab at Toulouse, my, one of my mentors. We flew him. He builds um, pulse magnets. Guys, Let me when I tell you that we can bring pulse magnets to all of your facilities for the cheap, I really mean it. Like, we will build these things together, and they will be like working scientific equipment that you can use, you can teach out of it, you can do research out of it. We can get you up to like 10 Tesla at room temperature. You don't need any cryogens. You can do all types of experiments with that. He goes all over the world and he builds these things, right? Now, important, again, a second generation Nigerian young woman by the name of, um, of Victoria Abadeyu. I'll show you a video in a second of Victoria Abadeyu. But Victoria Abadeyu, she is now, again, at P she's getting her PhD. So she was with me at Howard University. She's now getting her PhD in applied physics at Harvard University, all from Atlanta. And, her, and she's Nigerian, right? And now she's more than happy to come and talk to you guys. She'll be more than happy. But this is dope to me, right? This is my mentor's mentor. And this is somebody that I'm mentoring. And they're passing that knowledge to each other. I, this is what it's all about. This is how we're going to make a change in this game. Again, by this investment, we're now increasing our profile of HBCUs in the QIS research. Right here, this paper, if you want to know the real details of the IBM HBCU Quantum Center, I can send you this paper. It works it out. This is me and Kayla from IBM. We're the ones that started it. That's got all the game in it. These papers right here, We'll talk more about building a quantum engineering program. And then this is one of the great papers that I'm on. A lot of this stuff is out of my group because I was the one that was leading, but it's not just me, right? And it's even grown even more. Like the first year we had one, so we're only in year three. The first year we had a student, uh, we had one of the, so we had 30 students and they're across all four years. So we graduated maybe like six or seven, um, but we only had one of the students that went into quantum to get their PhD at the Joint Quantum Institute um, out of the first year. In the second year, now we have five students. We had Victoria, we had Jalen, um, we got my boy, he's out of UCLA from Morehouse. Like, this is what we do. This is how we're changing our community. IBM makes that investment, I make good on that investment, right? And now things are happening for young people that wouldn't happen before. And you know, I get a little shine every once in a while. <laughs> things I never would imagine. Um, so I was able to go to MIT. You remember I was a six-year-old kid reading this book about a laser physicist at MIT by the name of Ronald E. McNair. Well, man, I'm not quite an astronaut, but I do have an MIT email address. And I and I did do a lot of great experiments there. Um, so the other thing that was dope too is that I was also a part of what's called Black and Quantum. Please read this. This is written by my man, Robert Davis. We got to tell our own story. 
We can't let them tell our story. And in that, Robert Davis, he was able to to really, really, really talk about the how black scientists in America contributed quantum from the beginning and where we are now. And the good thing is that it doesn't highlight me that, um, that much. Now, the other thing is that OSA, the Optical Society of America, they're doing things, highlighting what I'm doing. And then I'll show you this video. This is a crazy experience about the impact of the of the IBM HPCU Quantum Center. So all of these things are there, right? And then, well, this is the craziest part. So in uh, OSA, this is a, a, a international organization. I would never thought ever in a day when I was in the labs, like just doing things at Rice University, that I would ever be on the cover of a magazine, right? Like, this is what's happening. That small lab that Rock built put me on the cover of a magazine. That's the type of thing that can happen if you if you work at it the right way. And now, mind you, that just did that for me, right? Now, what can I do for everybody else? Because I'm on the magazine. That's great. They see my face. What they don't realize is that everybody from my community is on that magazine, man. My whole community and my whole community put me through this. That's why when I got the copies of it, I handed it to everybody. I was like, we all here. We finally up here. And that's what I want to do with y'all. So let me do it. Now, just a little bit about this science stuff, and then we can talk for a while. But this is my group at the time. Um, and really, my group, this is what we're doing. We're, we're looking at quantum information, quantum materials, quantum communications. This is Atiyah. I talked about Atiyah before. This is Chan, my first PhD student. This is Ashley. Ashley's there. She's about to, I'm going to talk more about Ashley, but she did her proposal the other day. I'm a big Arsenal fan, man. Arsenal's up. Shout out to Kanu. Kanu is one of the best Arsenal players ever. But I'm a big Arsenal fan. I always got Arsenal on. Um, but then, like, this is my group. We're starting to grow. Now, our group now comes on. Like, yeah, let's go. My group is now 100% all women. These are my four graduate students. They are all fantastic. They they are working very, very, very hard. I cannot wait um, to see what they're about to do when they go to the next level. I'm a little bit of science. I can't be here without talking a little about what we do. So what we have here is these meta atoms. So this is a meta material array. Split ring resonator. So each one of these things, you can think of them as like an elemental atom, right? And then if I change these things around, what happens? So what we're doing here is this thing called cooperativity, our, our um, super radiance and our decay cooperativity. So in this nanoletters paper in 2022, what we show for the first time is the square root of two over the density showing of terahertz metamaterials as a platform for a cubic. Please read. It's dope work. I really liked it. We also working with carbon nanotubes still in the sense that um, typically you would have your carbon nanotubes, they're made in a solution. You can filter that solution down into a film that you can then fabricate devices out of it, right? Um, what you want to do, what typically happens is that you want them all to be aligned and then you can pattern those and all. But what happens is you have alignment at the top of the film and you don't have alignment at the bottom of the field. So essentially this red part shows alignment. So at the at the top of the film, you have everything that was aligned, but at the bottom of the film, it would look like this. And what we didn't realize or what the people didn't realize is the reason why it always would look like this was because in the vacuum filtration, you would have what was called, and we could, we could set this up too in Africa. The nanotube thing we'll have to figure out, but we can set up this filtration thing. Um, but that said, uh, you got a meniscus that would form. So if you chemically treated the glassware, like as simple as like using detergent, like changing the way that you clean the glassware, then now you no longer have a meniscus. And by no longer having a meniscus, now you have alignment throughout the entire film. Um, we're hoping to use that film for optics and photonics. Please, please, please reach out if that's something that you're interested in. Um, here, this was another paper. This is an Optica. This is OSA's top optics journal. Um, here, what we have is a, a flexible photonic crystal. And in particular, what you see, this is a cartoony picture, but these arrays, they typically sit on a piece of plastic called Kapton. 
And Kapton is temperature, high temperature sensitive, but it's also flexible. So we had this uh, metal material way, and we had this on, um, we had the metal, like aluminum, like 100 nanometers of aluminum pattern on 25 microns of uh, Kapton. And then that's how we did a lot of the terahertz matter material work. And I went to the student, I went to my boy Chan, again, Chan's my first PhD student, but he was also a Morehouse guy. So I go to Chan and say, hey man, they always say that these things are like atoms. So can we start to impose defects, right? What happens if we take one element away? Um, how does that change? Or what if we only focus on one element, right? And very creatively, what Chance did was he actually just drilled holes in the plastic. And then what we found was that this is actually one of the first terahertz photonic crystals, but it is the first terahertz photonic crystal that's flexible. And that flexible modality allows for one to take the guided mode resonance and tune that by flexing the angle from zero to 0 0.5 to 10 degrees. And that was an optical, one of my favorite papers. We like it. Um, and now I do a little, a lot of what's called quantum uh, information, quantum computing using IBM systems. IBM gave me that money. They gave me that access and we went to work with it. I'm um, more than happy to work with you all in this too. So in these papers, we, we do it in what's called quantum state tomography, but we're applying convolutional neural networks to quantum state tomography to improve the noisy intermediate scale computers that are available over the cloud. We're doing a lot of work in this space and it's very, very exciting. You'll learn more about it a little bit later. We're also in this idea of quantum networking where we're building quantum networks all over the world. Hey man, let's go to Africa and let's build some of these quantum networks over there. We're more than happy again. Let's do it. Let's make that happen. Now, last but not least, I'm talking about where I am because I want you guys to come and see what's happening in Chicago. So Chicago is a research one. So we're heavy in research and then um, a state funded. We're a state school and we are here for the city of Chicago, right? Chicago has a, it's one of the largest cities in America. The economy of Chicago is like most nations. Um, and it's a large, large investment in universities. Uh, we're well positioned and we are the epicenter of quantum. I'll talk a little bit that, about that in the next talk. Um, but we also have around 34,000 students. What they don't tell you about Chicago is that we have the beach. I love going to the beach. <laughs> and it's very nice. Um, this is there. This is cool. Um, Chicago's it's very, very important. Like they're making one of the largest investments in quantum um, here. Our past mayor, Chicago is proud to become a major hub. We are a major hub. We just got, they they chose two tech hubs, any type of technology, but the two quantum technology hubs, one is in Chicago and the other is in Boulder, Colorado. Chicago is where it's at. So let's work together and make this happen. Um, the other thing, I know this is an astrophysics type of thing, and astrophysics has a very important part in quantum mechanics. In particular, this uh, Superconducting Materials and Systems Center, or SQMS, is at Fermi National Lab. Um, I, if, if students are really, really interested in learning astrophysics, but also learning quantum, please reach out to me. Let's see what we can do. Um, my colleague, Sylvia Sorzetti, she went to South Africa and spoke with some students recently. Let's make it such that me and Sylvia come and talk to y'all in person. Um, and, in, and in that case, let's also bring some opportunities where students can come to the lab and, and faculty can come to the lab because, you know, there's no diss to, to what's going on. But other universities around the world have these connections. Why not Africa? So last but not least, we're going to close and then, and then I'll talk a little bit about the timing of it all. But last but not least. I want to talk to you all about how you can change your lab and create your own world and hopefully change the lives of others, right? Because I was in an environment where my life was changed by Rock and Kono and others. Hopefully I made a bit of an impact. I think you can say I made a bit of an impact. We out here doing it. We still doing it. We helping some people. But let me give y'all what I like to call a little advice on how you can create your own lab. 
man, this is one of my favorite rappers, right? He has this book. It's called the, the Gucci Man Guide to Greatness. If you guys don't know a lot about Gucci Man, he has a very, very story life. I mean, bro got an ice cream cone on his face. You know what I'm saying? He's had, he's been in the trenches. It's been a lot. However, this is Rihanna. Hold on. And then, I, so I'm giving you advice from Guwap. I'm giving you advice from my graduate students. And I'm giving you advice from myself. All right. So I'm a big Rihanna fan. Like y'all have no idea. But Rihanna, she posted this. She says, if you can't handle me at my 2007 Gucci Man, then you don't deserve me at my 2017 Gucci Man. So this is Gucci. He's, he's lovingly called Fat Gucci here. Uh, and this really talks about how you can make a transformation in your life from where you're really, really struggling to like really, really doing something and being the best that you can be. And actually his last album is talking about fatherhood, which is very important. Things like that, right? So you're going to the killing and robbing and all this crazy stuff. You can either you can either build or you can destroy people. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm more of a builder. Let's build together. So he went from destroying to building, right? And that's that's the transformation transformation that Rihanna highlights there. But more importantly, in this book, and this is what I'll tell you all, there's a lot of stuff in there, but these are kind of my favorite six. Stop underestimating yourself. Just don't do it. Like you can do. It. Stop underestimating yourself. Number two, keep improving, right? If you're if you're struggling at something, just work at it. And then and like number three, every day is a chance to get better. Like you got an opportunity today. Do something. Whatever's bothering you, just go do it. Write it down. Target the goal. Do that. Number four, man, stay ready. You guys wanted me to come here. This is a talk. We had it ready. Package. Stay ready. You never know. I saw Walter Massey yesterday. I was like, man, let me show him this. I didn't know he was going to pop up. You got to stay ready. Number five, haters going to say that you were cloned. When Gucci Mane, when Gucci Mane uh, went from this to this, they said that he was in jail and the government replaced him and cloned him. Seriously, that's what people were saying. <laughs> no, man, just because he made a change in his life, it wasn't no brand new government person. He just made that change to make himself better. Haters going to say that you were cloned. Don't even worry about what the haters are going to say. Just do what you're going to do. And number six, never quit on yourself. There's going to be some times where you're going to struggle, but don't quit. Never quit on yourself. Now, the name of this talk is a small objects lab can change the world, right? It's in this called this field guide. This is free. I'll send this to y'all. Y'all can read the full thing. I would love for you to read it. But I took this as a, as a to to honor the life of an optics educator that I'd never had a chance to meet, but I was lucky enough to be asked to write a short field guide for optics education. And in that, I took that as an opportunity to work with my personal uh, graduate students. I wanted them to give some advice. You know what I'm saying? Because I learned from my mentees. They teach me all the time. They're, they're young women, uh, women of color in this science game, and they're experiencing this very, very different than I ever imagined that I would experience it. So I've learned a lot working with my students. I've learned how to be a better mentor just from doing things for them. Um, and in that, we use this opportunity to give best practices for mentoring students in optics from the perspective of my current graduate students. And this is the advice that they had, that you need to create space. You need to be human. You as the mentor, you, you need to be a human being because you are a human being. Why are you trying to be some... Why are you trying to present yourself as some superhero when your alter ego is the one that people are interacting with? Um, the other thing that I want to say is that their lab is more than just for research and to use it as a as a counter space. Um, this idea is very, very important. And last but not least, research is an opportunity for all students, not just the best ones. Man, you apply these things. They have GPA requirements. They have test exams, scores, all that, this, that, and the third. Man, the problems are bigger than just that. We need everybody involved. Everybody has a role to play. Why don't we bring in research to the people in Africa, man? Let's do it. I So I see Harrison right here. I answer that question a little bit. Um, and then just, just again, there's another Gucci line for my, for my student. She had one right there. I'm almost done. All right. Now, from my perspective, this is what I'm saying. This is my guy right here, Keith Jackson. He's a beast. 
Morehouse graduate, used to be in the lab. He wrote a crazy story about how labs didn't hire black people at the time. Um, and, you know, they're getting a little bit better now. Um, but that said, these are kind of five things I would like y'all to do. You got to compete. Like you think you can't compete, but you can compete globally. I promise you. If you're doing these other things, you can also compete. This is my favorite one. Always give somebody a chance. Like if you, if you if you get an opportunity, somebody gave all these things, everything I'm talking about, somebody gave me a chance, man. Somebody took a chance on me. They were like, hey, I see something in this kid. Can he do this? Can he do that? Now I'm able to do so much for so many people. Like you can do that. Just give somebody a chance. Number number three, self to like if you're self-determined, you can go far in life. But if you know yourself, then you can take you even further. I happen to go to therapy a lot these days and I'm learning a lot about myself and hopefully I can take that further. And last but not least, man, define success for yourself. Don't be living for all these other people. They want to say, oh, you want to do, you want, you need to have 85 science papers. You need to have 85 nature papers, X, Y, Z. Man, that last paper that I wrote on Macala, I wrote that paper for us. Then it becomes a journal art. Uh, then it becomes a cover article on AVS quantum science. When I wrote that paper, I didn't care if people liked it or not. I liked the I liked the science. I thought it was cool. I was I was connecting with West Africa in some type of way. But now, like literally yesterday, people at University of Illinois or Ben is like, man, Thomas, that paper is crazy. I said, thank you. I really appreciate it. But I ain't do it for them. I did it for me. You know what I'm saying? I was in Singapore. Dude was like, man, that last paper you wrote was really dope. I said, thank you, sir. Like, I'm defining success for myself. Now, the other part, I'm celebrating every win. Every time something good happens, man, I pop a bottle of champagne. We've been popping bottles of champagne lately. You got to take a, you got to take a, you got to take a break and say, hey, man, we did that. And then you can go do the next thing. So that's my advice for T. Searles. Now, the other one. This is very, 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 very important. It's okay to cry. You know, like sometimes it's gonna be bad, and just let it out. There's no shame in that. And then the other one is that you gotta find your why. This is my gorgeous, beautiful wife. She's my why. She's why I'm doing everything, right? All of this all points back to why I'm doing this, right? And then last but not least, you need to plant a seed so that it can grow, man. I'm hopeful that I'm planting the seed right now in the Nigerian, in the National Nigerian um, Association of Physics Students. I'm planting you this seed that you guys can do this, right? Ha, that is funny, Prof. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. That's good. That's going to be a good one. But yeah, sorry. Plant a seed so that it can grow, right? And then and then now that, we, that we're going to let this thing grow, so now I plan to see in in a in an APS, right? Now you guys can take that seed and it can grow into a tree that will bear fruit. And that fruit, now you can guys can plant another seed. You reaching people that I can't even reach. You reaching the communities where you came from. You know what I'm saying? Like, please, please, please do not sleep. Plant that seed, man, so that it can grow. Last but not least, there's World Quantum Day. It happens every April 14th. Let's get Africa more involved. Please, let's get Africa more involved. If if any professors, if any students, if there's anybody in Africa that wants to be involved in World Quantum Day, please let me know. I will make sure that that happens. All right? So, I really, really, really like it. You know what I'm saying? If we could have a chance to, to answer some questions and talk a little bit. Again, this is Chicago, baby. We on the beach. I got my Arsenal jersey on. Like this is this is really where it's at. Um, and with that, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take as many questions as possible. Um, Dosu, could you help me with the chat on the questions? Maybe you can ask them to me, so that way I I won't necessarily have to keep clicking through. Yeah, yeah, yes. But thank you all for your attention, man. And let's let's talk a little bit. Uh, thank you on. so much for the presentation, sir. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I can begin to explain how I felt. I think at the very start, I actually dropped it here. <laughs> it was... Hey, man, I, it's okay to cry. I put that <laughs> on there. 
Trust me, I, I was at NSBP. I was listening to the story of a woman by the name of Zelda Gills. Man, y'all need to look up Zelda Gills. Zelda Gills was talking about how she had two kids in graduate school. My student got two kids in graduate school. Man, I was I was I was in tears, bro. Like that's okay. Don't even worry about that. But yeah, yeah just ask the question. Okay, um, so there's this question from uh, Mbarisin. So guys, please, if we have questions, you should go to the um, comment section and drop your questions. I'm going to read them out and try to um, attach your name to the questions too. Um, so this one is from Mbarisin. He said, um, from the slide we saw, we have quantum computing communications, etc. Since we are from Africa, is there, a, um, is there a possibility of having quantum agriculture since agriculture is the simple of occupation for the poor in Africa? Yeah, so I'm not familiar with quantum agriculture. Um, I would love to learn more about it. Um, my naive idea of what that looks like. So, uh, you know, I'm from Georgia, man. We, we grow on peanuts and picking cotton where I'm from. So I know what agriculture is. Um, there are scientific advancements that you can make in agriculture um, with respect to either tending the field, seed growth, organization, optimization, right? I could see how optimization, a lot of those things could happen um, where, for instance, um, you could develop or use a quantum algorithm to, to organize the farm in some way or, or have resources. Um, and then the other thing that you can do is that I know for a fact that there is a large space in kind of remote sensing. So having drones monitor crops in some way, but also having the drones talk together. So in there you have something called quantum communications that people are working on that could be applied in some way. But, you know, that's something that I had to think about. Um, but more than happy, I mean, that could be the lane that you could drive. Like you got to know what interests you and what is important in your community. Um, there are uh, tons of agriculturally based institutions in the United States that are also working on quantum. So if we find the right one, I can make that connection for you. Not a problem. Um, there's Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. It's a lot of A&Ms and a lot of A&Ts in the, in, the, um, in the HBCU space. That if that's something that you want to do, let's make it happen. Now, that said, just like uh, agriculture tech in general is a very, very important topic in Singapore um, because they got to they can't necessarily grow their food. Uh, they have what's called a 2030 initiative where 30 percent of their food needs to be grown in Singapore for them to really survive. And they are working on that using technology startups. And all types of things. So there may be some quantum aspects there that that you might want to look into. But I mean, those are the types of problems that I hope y'all can solve, man. Like, yeah, <laughs> no, I'll just leave it at that. But Africa is a very important place right now. Right. Um. So there's this one from Becky. Um. She said, "What are the major key challenges you foresee during this journey?" And how do you recommend that aspiring scientists um, prepare for that? Man, I mean, there's a lot of challenges. I mean, you could you could pick any of them. Um, I think the the biggest thing to me, man, is that information is really physics, right? Um, and I mean that in the sense that not even like quantum information, but the way that if you start to think of information in a different way then you start to realize that what type of information kind of war we're in. Um, meaning that is the video generated by AI, is it not generated by AI? Is there ways of us to detect that? Like those are the types of problems that I think we're dealing with right now. Um, in the US specifically, I feel like there's an information war on our kids and I don't really appreciate it. Um, our TikTok's very different than other people. They feeding us that nonsense. Um, and there's things scientifically that you can do about that. Um, I think there's also challenges with the climate. Now, I will say this, quantum computing ain't gonna say I'll solve climate change. However, man, the world is, is working itself, it's recalibrating itself in a way that we all need to be prepared for. Um, I think that's a huge challenge. And I, if you're interested in working on that, please do so. Um, 
I think we have a challenge of just working together. Um, there's a lot of division in the world at a time where these problems are big. Quantum computing, quantum internet is a problem such that I, I would hope that the world could work together and it's not necessarily working together in that way. If that's making sense to what, if I'm making sense of what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? Like there shouldn't be cases where U.S. scientists can't go to certain countries because of X, Y, and Z. Like that's going to limit us in the long run. Um, so I think addressing those type of issues are the ones. I mean, and we could talk like specific scientific things that I think need to be done. Um, but th there are, I, in my head, what I said was very scientific, but it might not have come off, <laughs> cut off across that way. Right. Uh, so um, there's this person that wants to ask a question, but said it's a long one. If Blessing is here, I think you should. I'm going to ask you to unmute. So you should be able to do that. Oh, okay. Uh, we're struggling to hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Um, can you hear me, please? Yes, yes. Oh, um, yeah. Um, thank you very much, um, Prof. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, from my own perspective, Africa has really been suffering with uh, getting themselves or getting, getting the whole continent into a quantum computer. Even I think as, as at this time, um, we're still even having issues with understanding how um, classical bits can be converted into quantum bits. I, I'm very sure I'm very sure that is how backward we are in this whole um, in this whole thing. Right. Um, with IBM, right, I think um, the only opportunities we have to explore IBM computers, um, I think they have an API where you basically just run some of your um, quantum programs directly on the IBM's quantum computers. So aside from this, this seems to be all that we, all the assets that we have um, to IBM. And um, with, with related to what you're talking about, continuous research with IBM and all of that, how can we, is there, is there, is there a thing you can advise Africa, maybe one way or the other, um, to get involved um, in, real development. I mean, right now I'm not talking about just running the simulations on the IBM computer or something. I'm talking about the real development. Uh, you're talking about um, quantum um, networking the other time, where you said um, you're thinking of building quantum network across the whole world. Um, one way or the other, can Africa be part of this and how? Because um, I, I won't lie to you, everything, um, basically I have, I have an ongoing research in the quantum advancement uh, which related to the, the uh, which related to issues that it might have on our, on our classical mathematical cryptography, you know, the likes of Schultz algorithm and um, Grover's um, Schultz algorithm, which is, is a very big threat. But all of these are just simulations that we do um, we carry out some quantum computer using the, the IBM's API. How do we get to have um, physical access, being able to build these devices and all of that? I mean, we're really backward. And can, can you advise maybe based on government aspects or some other things? And um, are there opportunities out there that you think Nigerian students can really exploit to, to, to dive more into um, this whole quantum computer thing, right? Because I don't even think um, up to three or five universities in Nigeria offer this course at PSC level, or not even master's level. Okay, yeah. Um, so a couple things there. Um, you're not that backward or behind. I mean, it might feel like that, but you're not, not at all. The majority of the world is trying to figure that out. Um, and there's tons of resources outside of IBM that you can take advantage of. Um, I will say that there is utility um, in using those simulations. So if you look at um, the Mike and Ike book that was written 20 years ago, which is like kind of the Bible of quantum information, there's chapter seven is called physical qubits. Um, 20 years ago, everything that the whole IBM operation and that entire book of like 900 pages 
is in a paragraph. That was 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Now they're doing all this, right? Things are moving fast in quantum. Um, you're right in saying that quantum hardware and having like quantum hardware is difficult in Chicago, right? Um, or Boston or LA or wherever. Like it's difficult everywhere to do that. People are trying to do that. Um, something that's more accessible is this idea of quantum networking, quantum key distribution. Um, there, those setups are a little bit easier. Um, that would be where I would would think that you should start. Um, with respect to resources, though, I'll send a, a list of I'll send a list of resources to Dosu, and including like internships opportunities for international students. Um, interacting with uh, I do a lot with Canada. Um, you guys should take a look at they got a lot going on with Canada. Um. We can write some proposals, man. There's there's gonna be some ways that that we can work together such that we can bring US scientists to those five universities in Nigeria. That's not a problem. I uh, um the other thing that's popping that you said, uh let me think. Oh yeah, yeah. I wanted to add the stuff with respect to Singapore. So Singapore, one of the interesting things that they got going on is that uh, they've had one of the largest quantum centers for a while. I'll put it in the chat. Inside of the Singapore joint, um, along with kind of, they have some really good materials about like learning about quantum at different stages. Um, so I'll try to see if I can show that to you. So use those. But more importantly, one of the things that the dude in Singapore is doing whatever that I got excited about um, is that you have this concept of having uh, satellites in low Earth orbit that actually are quantum satellites. It's a dude named Alex Ling. And what he does, and he showed me the satellites, as you know, but um, the thing is that those satellites can talk to each other, but they also need to talk to the ground, right? So this idea of developing a ground station that talks with those satellites and putting that in Nigeria or wherever, like we can talk to Alex, let's make it happen. Those things cost a lot of money, man, but like it's gonna be important to have those tests and abilities all over the world. Why would we have a gaping hole there? Um, so yeah, like that's I think is very achievable. But also I'd say like starting small is cool, right? Like I think um you don't need your own quantum computer, like deal fridge, all of that. The the quantum computers of the day, man, they're not gonna be the quantum computers of tomorrow. You know what type of cell phone I used in college? The thing was like this big. That was 20 years ago. Now iPhones are all everywhere in the world, right? We now have the attention and the investment of everybody. And, and that's what I'm saying. Like just, just having you interested and aware that this is going on. And again, the, these resources are out there. And if there's a way that I can get the resources to you that you can learn, right? Like the whole point is like, you can build you a small optics lab. And that small optics lab in Africa can do so much. And I'm more than happy to work with you there. Right. So don't look at it as more of like a uh, man, my people are stuck out in some backwards way, whatever, whatever. You just don't got the resources. But now you're talking to me, man, I got a lot of resources. I know people that got a lot of resources. So that's that's really that's really kind of the the, the disparity is that the elite and the, the boys at the top, they just keep on eating. Like, what about the people at the bottom? I ain't even saying I'm at the bottom. But one of my homies, what what he used to say to me, man, is like, for you to be successful in this game, you need an 800 pound gorilla. And what he mean by that is like, yeah, you walking, but people don't want to mess with you because you got an 800 pound gorilla behind you supporting you. I'm more like a 400 pound gorilla, man. But you know, it's 400 pounds, and I got and I got like 25 800 pound gorillas behind me. So that that's kind of what can change that with respect to Africa. Now, the very, very important part that you said is that the African government has to be involved, right? The U.S. government's involved. Um, that part we can work on too. Um, the president of, of uh, Nigeria went to Chicago State University. <laughs> like, don't trip. We can, we can, we can get, we can get, we can get to the, the places where we need to be to talk about this. Trust me. Um, so, 
write up something, man, and send me an email about what you really want to do. And then from there, there's also um there's an African quantum group, actually. Um, this guy for ride. I'll send it to you guys, but there's a quantum African group starting that with the purpose of talking to African governments like that. Farai. I don't know if you guys know Farai, but Farai is out in Kenya and he's doing a lot of stuff like that. Hey, I see that optics in Africa is theoretical. Getting optics labs will help. Yeah, we're going to, don't worry about that. Like, we can work on that portion of it. The setups aren't crazy. Like, it's a beam splitter. A beam splitter goes a long way in quantum. All right. Uh, I think there's a question here. Okay. I think there's just a lot of questions about opportunities and all of that. And I think uh, you've discussed that already. We'll just, um, I think the idea would be for us to, um, Dr. Thomas is going to, I don't know, like she reads a um, list of opportunities and I think I'll be sending it um, via email and uh, platforms for corresponding with you guys. I think that would be the easiest way to do this because there's a lot of questions that you guys are asking. And yeah. And yo, I'm on Twitter too. Like tweet me, I'll answer. I that's a, that's really why I started a Twitter, to be honest. Was I was teaching a class of like 100, 200 students. I couldn't keep up with the email. So they used to just tweet me questions. So I tweeted them back. Right. Tweet me a question. It's all good. Mm -hmm. I think I think there's just a lot of questions about okay there are some questions about um people wanting to um switch from backgrounds in um say mechanical engineering to uh, this that is it possible to do that yeah 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 so um the the beauty of quantum and I think something that I don't know how much time I'll have with y'all. I can show y'all a couple other things. But the, the beauty of quantum is, is bringing all these fields together, right? Chemistry has a lot of quantum in it. Um, materials in itself are fairly quantum in a sense. Um, you have optics and photonics. You got engineering. You got all of that coming together. Computer science, mathematics. All of these are quantum-related fields. Um, so I'm not saying that you need to to be a quantum field theory expert to be able to use, like most people use a television and don't know how a television works, right? Um, so I'm not saying that you have to do that. And you can you can build you can build TVs and not have a degree type of thing, right? Um, so I think it's more just about awareness, knowing what's going on and being interested. If you have that excitement around it. The, the way that quantum is set up now is that the entire worldwide quantum community prides itself on openness and availability and accessibility. So if you really, really want to get into it, it's possible. There's no barriers there. You just got to find the right people to put you in the right place. And I'm the right person to put you in the right place. Um, I think I answered your question there. One one thing that I always wanted to do, and that's something that I really want y'all to like work with me on, is like there are a lot of resources. There used to be this um this program, and I don't know if it exists anymore, but it used to be this program where US scientists could send equipment to other nations around the world. Um, so for instance, this is not and I'm I'm not talking about broke. I would never send y'all something that's broke. I'm talking about something that not even outdated, but just something that's just not there. You would be surprised how much stuff is just like laying around. Um, and then I think that I can really, really make a huge impact. Um, and that's something that I think we should work on, specifically with historically black colleges and universities. Like, I feel like we should match some universities up together we can try to start with Howard University, see what they do. <laughs> if they don't do it, we can work on Morehouse. But I think that like getting y'all those resources, I think is important. Um, and then again, like, let me show you guys something as far as 
if you'll indulge me a second, there are internships that are global. Uh, give me one second, it's coming up. All right, sir. Um, please, I need to quickly um, tell everyone something. So, um, for the okay. That I currently underscore. We've dropped a link in the um chat section. Um, please go there. It's a survey of sorts. So please quickly take out um take the survey. The we need to. You find your questions that you need to answer there. If you have um, questions that so we'll know what to, the questions to forward later to um, Doctor Thomas. So please um do that. So just a little bit to show you guys. Um, so the first internship. I'm sorry, the first um, website, it's uh, it's based in the U.S., QEDC. There may not be a lot of opportunities there, but I would say just send people an email. There's a lot of stuff in the U.K., you know what I'm saying? Like one of the company's inflections is in the U.K. Some people that y'all need to connect with is actually the Blackett family. You guys know them? Dosu, have you heard of Blackett family? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all connect with them, man. They got a lot of stuff in the U.K. too. Um. There's also stuff with respect to um, the last one. I think is probably going to be the one that is most useful for you all. Um, and this is a program out of Germany. I think that's all the way open to everyone. Take a look at that. Um, and then yeah. there's also this Canadian stuff. Let me send that in there too right quick. So this is Waterloo. I had a, I had a great student go to Waterloo. If you guys really, really want to do this quantum thing, please hit me up and I can put you in contact with the Waterloo folks. But it was a great, great, great experience at Waterloo for the folks. Hold on one second. So this app is open now too. So please do this. Yeah, so I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things out there. Um, and then, like I said, with those two, I'll keep on working. And I'm trying to answer some questions. I see it. Somebody said, ah, so Caleb's asked if there's, uh, if I'm accepting graduate students, me personally, and is there funding available for both MS and PhD students? Um, I'm going to be honest with y'all, man. I'm tired. <laughs> so I can't. And then uh, I had a big, big group. My group had about 12 people in it at some point. Now you notice that my group is smaller. I'm trying to have a smaller group, me personally, right now. Um, that said, my colleague is just starting his group. Um, his group, Zizway Chase, he works with me. Like his his stuff is on the website. He's just starting. I know a lot of people that are just starting their groups. Um, so if you send me an email, which are CVM, like I get those emails all the time from other places, not Africa. I would love to get those emails from Africa. Please send them to me. Um, and, and, and if I, if you can't directly work with me, trust me, like there are ways to work in the system. My brother Musa, man, there's a cat by the name of Musa Nome in Gong. He's Senegalese. There's also, uh, in Dayo. He's also Senegalese. Um, them boys got big groups and they're more than happy to work with people. Musa's at RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He goes to Africa MRS. That's a material research society. Musa goes to Senegal every year. Interesting. Bro, I'll make sure that it, he makes that he can pivot. That's West Africa. They ain't too far. Musa will come down. He'll talk with y'all. Um, and and honestly, to, to be honest with you, he has a lot of opportunities. Just unfortunately, right now, I'm not trying to take any more students because I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to get to January, <laughs> but um. But I will say for real, like that's the way it is now. Something might happen very, very different in a year or two from now. Um, so regardless, like I said, multiple, multiple, multiple people from all over the world send me emails about the group. Um, please send me the email. We can see what's going on. Yeah.
Um, I think um, with respect to the internships, the, there's a question that I think people are trying to ask, but I've not been phrasing well. Um, so basically, I think um, if um, applications are um, going to be uh, judged or screened, Right. Um, they, I think for most um, internship application, they usually demand for um, select out recommendations, for instance. Right. And I think most of the people that will be applying for these opportunities, right, they are not coming from a background where the professors even, it's even possible that the professors have never heard anything about quantum computing before. Right. Mm -hmm. And so how do they get um, like a good um, letter of recommendation, for instance? Does that not if, um, affect the application? I think people yeah. are uh, start well. No, I think that's a that's a very, 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 very good question. Um, and you're correct in saying that due to resources, doing doing to very busy, like sometimes professors aren't able to write the letters in the way that they're supposed to for people, right? Um, I would say no, don't give up, right? This is why I think it's important that when I, the point when I said somebody gave me a chance, like my H index is still at 11. People care about H index, but it was like one, two years ago. Like people invested in me and I made the best on their investment. So whatever that first opportunity is, man, make it such that go into that opportunity wanting to get that letter of recommendation or um even better in your own local environment with your own professor say hey you know you might not know this thing called quantum computing but at the end of the day it's an opportunity for people in physics and engineering to do something and like you really want to go to xyz is there a way you know i'm sure they're they're going to judge you on the marks or whatever that you had in class um but i would say that and then again, like I'm going to put some pressure on IBM um, and other folks that that say that they want to interact with Africa in this way um, to then have that ability to do so. I know for a fact Rice University is working with Africa and specifically Nigeria um, and wants to do more. And that might be an opportunity for a lot of the people who are here to start working closely with me and others in my community, right? Um, but that said, I, that is a, there's, there's, there's two difficulties I see in doing that, right? There's not a lot of quantum around. That's very similar to HBCU space. Um, and then there's also not a lot of, um, oh, and sometimes there's limitations with respect to like international students going places, whether that's financial, political, whatever, right? I, I understand that too. Um, however, I'd say just keep on trying, keep on doing, just stay in the game, get on Twitter, say, see what's involved. Um, there is on recorded live on YouTube. I'm not going to say why people care a lot about Africa. I care about Africa because I see myself as a displaced African, but other people have interest in Africa for natural resources. Quantum's coming to Africa believe it um and and I, and I want you all to be prepared for that um so if there's anything that I can do to help tell your profs to email me we can write proposals together we can start quantum programs that way that's that's really what you should do and then more than and then the guy let me let me drop Farai stuff in there man because Farai really wants this to happen and then the other thing that you all can do I don't know if you have um if you have student chapters, yeah, have you, do you all know about Africa quantum.org? Nope. Um, so let me show it to you. This is happening. I'm telling you, we're going to make it happen. So this is for Rise stuff right here. I can have Farai come and talk to you all. You can join now. You can make it happen. These are the benefits. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, that's it. AfricaQuantum.org. That's where it started. But this is the organization I was talking about that is lobbying with different governments and universities to bring quantum to Africa. It's happening. Connect with them. Connect with me. Connect with other resources. The other one that I want to show you is uh, there's Africa MRS that happens. So this was in Senegal. Oh, 2024 is in Rwanda. Y'all meet me in Rwanda. <laughs> Let's do it. But yeah, so things like, oh, I don't know where they went, screen. But things like this are happening. And I'm serious about meet me in Rwanda in 2024. I'll go. Um, matter of fact, there's a way I can figure it out. I might make a pit stop. But uh, that said, like, for real, there's stuff that's out there. You can connect in that way. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think we have any um, present questions again. I think every um, other question has been categorized into um, the same thing. So I believe we'll just... Uh, we're collecting the survey to know what they are asking questions around, and then I'll forward um, it to you in detail um, for yes. us to um, address this thing. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, sir, for this. I think it's an absolute, I don't know, I, I don't think I can <laughs> explain the feeling myself. I mean, it was so cool. Uh, it wasn't just about, because um, I think uh, it's, I, I don't think the problem really for the students is about um, what to do, right? It's just that I think um, most people be, um, begin with, so this is what you should do, uh, right? And this is how you do it. But I think the most pressing question really is the why um, should you even care about these things in the first place? And I think that was the most beautiful thing about, about the lecture, um, this talk, right? Because of the way you began and then um, beauty top into the more um I don't know the more complex narrative but then it came from a place where everyone can relate and then um I think that beauty top beautifully and I really really love it I've gotten a lot of dms on whatsapp about people just saying really really interesting stuff they're really happy about it so thank you so much um, no y'all have I mean the few I'm feeling the same like the only unfortunate part is I can't be there with y'all in person but you have no idea how um, how excited I am about the fact that you all are working together. Y'all have some dynamic speakers, man. It's just not me. Like you bringing in Hakeem, you bringing all these other folks. Like keep on doing this activity, man. The thing about it is, there's no disrespect to the old people in the audience, but like the the young people are stepping up in major ways in the world. Um, my mom, my mom likes to say like. She did this, uh, my generation, <laughs> but she was like, <laughs> that my generation in the world, man, we didn't, we took a lot of nonsense and the young people aren't having, right? And she says it's more like them in the 60s, um, which I think that's a, a good opportunity for young science revolutionaries to, to be in that space. And, uh, and what I tell you, like, for real, for real, like the feelings that you guys are feeling, I'm feeling the same thing of excitement the fact that I'm able to to reach this many people and hopefully help you all in the way that people help me. Um, and again, you know, I'm trying to eat that jollof, bro. So, <laughs> so, so I'm trying to make that comparison. Let me know. And if you getting, if you come to the U.S. for real, mm -hmm. just, yeah. um, just hit hit me up. Like, even if I'm not around, whatever city you're in or whatever place you're in, man, there are people that are my people, the the members of the Lost Tribe, as they're called. <laughs> that, <laughs> would, that. That, would love, that would love to to interact with you and interact with students and all of that. I really um, love that. And then as, as far as like speakers too, man, like the people that I pointed out that will come and speak to y'all, like I just did over Zoom, there's a there's a there's a lot of us um that would love to do that. Um, and then again, like starting SPS chapters. So start your um, start your NSVP chapter, man. And then we can work on like the Blackett family. 
um, that's in the UK. They started their stuff mm-hmm. with us and they were able to send students to from the UK to um, our meeting and meet everybody. Right. Let's see if we can let's see if we can do something like that in 2024. The meeting's in Houston. So so yeah, let's let's really try to figure out if we can get, man. Right. I, I would love for all y'all to come, but let's try to get it 10 to 15. Let's send a delegation. Let's do that. That should be that, but let's keep the let's keep the dialogue going and y'all keep on doing what you're doing. Like for real. You you there are many, many times where I felt like, I mean, for real, for real, I felt like Man, I had all this science in me and I like I was restricted by my environment to be able to like bring it to the world. And all that really did was it prepared me to be able to once that chance came, I was ready. Right. You know what I'm saying? And what y'all are doing now is y'all are in the preparation stages. Right. So just continue to prepare. Use as many resources. Man, YouTube got crazy amounts of resources with respect to, to quantum information. Twitter used to, like, boy, Musk kind of killed it for whatever reason, but it's all good. Like we're, we, we're going to work together and we're going to make it happen. The fact that we had this interaction, it happened for a reason and let's just keep it going. But I'm telling you, the way that y'all are feeling, y'all, y'all have no idea. The type of week that I had, I need, <laughs> I needed this. <laughs> it's a mutual feeling. I'm happy to see y'all just as happy as you guys are happy to see me. Very good. Real good. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. All right, it's all love, man. Y'all take it easy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Go Arsenal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to, uh, we are ending the uh, class now. So, guys, I think you can unmute. I've given you the permission. You can unmute. Say thank you to Dr. Um, Thomas. Thank Is you. There thank Is there you a way so we can take it? Can, can people show their cameras? Can we take a selfie? Is there a way we can screenshot it? Please, guys, um, please try to turn on your camera. Uh, let me group selfie, I think. Let me see. If you can, there's no... I'm not forcing you to. <laughs> so please, you can turn on your camera. We want to take a group picture. Keep saying you disabled it. Oh, oh, I think I disabled that. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think the thing about fixing it now. Y'all, yeah, give me a second. My boy Moose is just text texting me. I'm I'm gonna call him and tell him he gotta come talk to y'all. Wow. But it's a lot of African brothers, man, in the U.S. They doing their thing. It's they're, you know, we need to work on the amount of 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 young women that come over here. But it's a guy named Chimbo, man. Y'all know Chimbo, Yane Chimbo. He's at Maryland. Talked to him yesterday. Yeah, he's from Cameroon. It's my boy. I, I show Bubakar Kante. He's from Mali. I show Wale. He's from Nigeria. Like them, they they'll come over here and they'll talk with y'all. So right. let's let's make that happen. But is there a way that we can screenshot these and then uh, y'all can yeah. send me the photos and then say, you know what I'm saying? I appreciate every single one of y'all, man. Y'all keep on doing this physics thing. For real. And tell them little kids too. Tell your little nieces, nephews, and all that that, that I'm waiting. Like that, that's those are the ones that are really gonna do the quantum computing thing. So we need to get it to them too. Um so. Definitely. Let's take is somebody screenshotting or is it recorded? Yeah, it's been recorded and I'm taking screenshots too. All right, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And definitely the faculty members, man, hit me up. Like there's some opportunities there. We'll definitely do that. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Much. Y'all have a blessed day, man. Y'all be easy. Take it easy. Yeah. Say bye to Dr. Thomas. You could say hello. Please fill the form before you leave. Thank you very much. Um, fill the form before you leave. It's in the Zoom chat. So.
Thank you very, very much. All right, all right. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys, for joining. Um, I think we've come to the end of today's lecture. Um, for the person that has been joining from Kenya, um, I think I mentioned this the last time. CERN is really looking for you, the person that has been joining from Kenya. So if you could please contact me. Um, I think uh, there is a very big opportunity for you to travel to Switzerland um, next year, July. So the person that has been joining from Kenya, I'll keep saying it. Please try to reach out. Hopefully you're on this call. We don't have your email. Uh, the link to, be, to the form has been dropped a lot, a good number of times. Um, so yeah, I think I, I should quickly talk about the next lecture. Right, I should talk about the next lecture. Um, so for the next lecture, what is going to happen is that uh, uh, we, for the next lecture, we're bringing um, Professor Akim Olushi. Right now, let me, I don't know if you guys know Akim Olushi because I don't, I, I'm trying as much as possible to not assume stuff of us now. But I practically grew up watching Akim Olushi, right? I've known him since I was very little. He talks on Discovery World. Um, and those top channels, right? So um, he's going to be coming, it was at NASA. Akim is so cool, right? I mean, I, I think we should stop streaming this. It's right. Um, let's stop recording.